John Reed will help you rethink the sales conversation. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer. You're a host. Today we have Mr. John Reed. What a good dude, smart dude. New book. You're going to like it. You're going to like this conversation. We did a lot of Dead Bulls advocate playing, and he rolled right with it. Uh, I gained some new insight in this, and you know, that's, that's honestly the biggest value to me and why I do this. I get to talk with smart people pick their brain for 30 minutes to an hour, and I learn something every time. So you're in for a treat with this guy. And you know, I should have opened with this one. Don't bring donuts, bring insight. That's one of the, that's one of the things I learned today, and you will too. And that was a writer downer. It's a, I've got it as the subtitle of this interview. Uh, John's a smart guy, and like I said, He's been in this a long time. He uh, has some gray hair, and he was happy to remind me of it. So I had to just sit here and take notes like a good little follower. You know, you want to be a great leader? Be a great follower. I have no problem listening to smart people. But uh, he wrote down a few things as well. So maybe the sales whisperer's got a few tricks up his sleeves. Might be worth listening to as well. So you came to the right place. I was going to get this out yesterday. But, you know, it all comes in threes. I hope it only comes in threes. We had a computer crap out, so bam, 650 bucks to fix that puppy. Then what? Oh, the Kirby vacuum cleaner. Well, that went out last week. That thing was supposed to last a lifetime. I think we got, I don't know, 12 years out of it. Pretty good, but not a lifetime. So replacement for that, a deal was $700. Goodness gracious. Then... Our refrigerator, the freezer goes out in the refrigerator. Hmm. So we got a new refrigerator. Got it delivered today. The guy ripped this connector thing off the wall, flooded the kitchen into the wall, into the living room. But fortunately, it wasn't a lot. We were able to catch it. And our neighbors are restoration people, so they've got a dehumidifier running downstairs. But, uh, man... Look, it happens to all of us. There's always setbacks, unexpected expenses. Do you quit? Do you curl up in a little ball? Do you get off your game? You know, life really is not what happens to you. It's how you react to what happens to you. So deal with it, okay? Yeah, it got us off our schedule a little bit, had to adjust some things coordinating visits to the Mac Genius store, coordinating visits to the showroom, looking at appliances. Uh, Okay, fine. You set aside some things. You should be busy, but you should build in slack time as well. Things, projects will always take longer. I'm I'm knee deep in several retoolings and, and new programs. I probably spent two hours on the phone today with various tech support people, everything from HubSpot to GoDaddy to Apple, working on, uh, I'm trying to do this work, trying to save an image. Oh, it tells me my iCloud storage is full. I'm like, the hell it is. I got two terabytes, you know, so things just weren't working. All right. Do you have the flexibility in your life and in your schedule that can absorb the inevitable setbacks? Or are you running your business, your life in a state of perfection, right? Where, where things need to be perfect in order for you to achieve what you've set out. Most people are. That's why one little grain of sand, one little pebble in their shoe, and everything's ruined. It's ridiculous. If you're running that tight, that high strung, if you need perfection to hit your goals, you need to get some advice. You need to get some outside perspective. You need someone you can pick their brain, someone that can give you honest feedback and new insight to change your thinking because you're going to burn yourself out doing that. I guarantee you. 
I've talked about this uh, earlier this year, last, last month or so, but you need to trust in yourself and invest in yourself. I've been talking about the Make Every Sale program for years. Dip your toe in the water. I just now changed the program a little bit, make it a little more affordable, $1,000 for eight weeks. You get 100% access to everything, and then it's $97 a month. If you choose not to remain, you still get all of the data, all of the, the information, all of the videos. You just don't get the weekly calls. But come jump in, makeeverysale.com. Let me help you get off this hamster wheel of perfection that's stressing you out, and it will implode. Don't let that happen. You can make 2019 the best year of your sales career. I guarantee it. Join makeeverysale.com. Now let's bring on our guest. John Reed, the uh, common sensical sales trainer and author, all the way from New Jersey. Welcome to the sales podcast, man. How the heck are you? Good. How are you doing today? I'm good. So you got this fancy book, getting all these rave reviews. <laughs> I mean, you know, I couldn't even get my mom to write a review, but you got like real people saying good things, right? Moving, yep. moving from models to mindsets, rethinking the sales conversation. Why do we have to rethink the sales conversation, huh? We grab them by the throat, we back them up against the wall. And say, you want to buy this or not, right? Come, come on, look, look, you're from Jersey. I know you've heard Jersey boys. <laughs> yeah. Right? I slammed his head into, his head into the hood. You know, you go buy a thing. He said, well, I, I, mean, I can tone it down a bit, right? Come on, do we have to change that model? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. You should ask that to start with that because, you know, that model, one can argue, can be okay, maybe, uh, for a <laughs> transactional sale. Like if you're selling timeshare, you're selling something where you're never going to see the person again. You're in the right. mall, you're running a kiosk, and you got to grab somebody by the lapels, as you just said. you got to close it because you know the minute they walk out of your site, it's over. Uh, then a very transactional, what we would call a, a, a snowman behavior in the book, uh, is appropriate. But for business to business, more complex selling, which falls in, into a lot of the area of selling, yeah, that's not going to work. Right. And what's been taught to these folks, and I've been, I'm old, I'm not old, I'm, I'm older than most of these folks. I'm 59, so I've been around. And, you know, the same stuff, the same exact stuff, surprisingly, shockingly, is being delivered in 2019 that was delivered in, you know, I would say 1980, you do this right, 1983, when I started with Dow Chemical out mm -hmm. of college. So, you know, uh, the same, you know, round up the usual suspects, like they say, uh, in Casablanca. That's how old I am. I use a Casablanca reference. Uh, you know, the usual suspects are still there, and they're still teaching the same stuff as if we're in a marketplace uh, that existed in the 1980s. And it, and it, I would argue at some level it's never worked, but it clearly doesn't work in my right. mind today because of its focus. So, right. So you got started in 83. I got started full-time sales, 97. Okay. Uh, I was, I was, had a little business on the side and I was still in the air force as early as 95. I'll call you kid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How you like so, that? Uh, would, and, and I was taught a lot of the same things you were. My, my first full-time job, I was a stockbroker. I mean, boiler room. Oof. We had two weeks of training in Memphis, and we had to go out into uh, a little side room and call into the auditorium with, you know, 30 or 40 other trainees sitting there and this old, grizzled, former Army drill sergeant. You yeah. know, he was, the only one, he was the only one allowed to still smoke. Right. He walked around the building smoking and he would put you on speakerphone so all the other 30 or 40 reps could listen. And we had to cold call him. OK. Right? And he would just grill us. And so you do what you got to do to get through training. Sure. sure. But would, would you say like those of us that have survived and even thrived, is it because we kind of sort of didn't do what we were taught and kind of figured out the right way on our own. Um, you know, cause did, did, did you do all the things they taught you or did you kind of modify it? And like, this doesn't feel very human. Yeah. Let me personalize I mean, this a bit. Yeah. I mean, the high performers obviously are always going to think what does work for me, given my style, there's things you can learn from all of the stuff. The problem with the stuff uh, that's out there, not the case that you gave, but you know, most of the stuff is driven from a model. 
So a guy like you or I comes across a model. We think we're smart guys. This is how we do it. Here's a model that shows how we do it. And if everybody just followed the model, they would do well. And so we become zealots. We become preachers. And it's about the model. And if the model doesn't work, it's not because the model's a problem. It's because you're a problem or your managers are a problem or your company's a problem because the model has to be the answer. (laughs) And because the model's the answer, it's worth a lot of money. So you have to pay me big intellectual property fees for me to come in because, my God, I got this model that is the answer to all your problems. And if your people will just listen to it, so the facilitator has to be the smartest guy in the room or woman in the room, the model's the answer. It's just a house of cards because in the real world, somebody's behavior is driven by a belief system. All of our behaviors, everybody listening to this, however you behave is driven by an underlying belief or mindset or based on experience. And so if I'm going to change somebody's behavior and teach them a skill, I've got to get down to the mindset belief situation. Right. And so that's where my book comes in. And that's what I've learned over the 20 years or what I've been doing this since I left the the, uh, chemical industry is really looking at what training companies do, how they do it, and then pondering why it doesn't work. And then thinking what does work and and then figuring out how to get this in the heads and hearts of uh, and the hands of salespeople so they can perform better. You know, it's interesting you you mentioned that. I was, uh, I'm in this mastermind group and we had a guest. Sounds like a, sounds like a cool group, the mastermind group. <laughs> mastermind, baby. What is, what is that all about? <laughs> I can tell you, but I'd have to okay. kill you. Do, okay, do you don't have clearance? Kill me. Do you have clearance? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Go ahead. But uh, so this guy, he was, uh, he was gray haired like you. Okay, if you're going to call me this young whippersnapper, all right? Um, but he he's well known and um, and he you know he made the transition from from quota carrying guy to author and consultant and okay and I was asking him about that like making that transition because personally like I'm going after larger accounts now as my business evolves and I've worked traditionally with entrepreneurs and small businesses and going after little bigger businesses and you know I said what was that transition was it your own intellectual property and system and he's like. He thought it was, right, like back in the day. But then he realized everybody already has a system. They already have their model. They don't need another model. No. They need accountability, right? They need motivation, inspiration, whatever. So would you you agree with that? Um, Yes and no. So I'm a big believer in the world does not need another model. And I do believe there's value in models. Right. So when models don't exist, models can be helpful. What I don't necessarily believe you know, there's skill and will always, right? Skill is knowledge and then will is motivation, all that stuff. And so some people become Tony Robbins. They can become like inspirational speaker, motivational speaker. That's how we're going to get them. Uh, and I think that's important too. But again, I think it's the underlying belief system. So for example, most salespeople believe they're good at relationship building. And if you believe you're good at relationship building, you're probably not going to pay a lot of attention to training on relationship building. we are not going to think it's relevant to you or you're going to think, yeah, I'm good at that. But we can put, you can put people through some activities pretty quickly and smartly that they'll self-discover, I am not good at relationship building. I am not as good as I thought. Because given the situation, I did not demonstrate that skill. Right. So for example, we, do, we have this great activity we do where it's a new client. You're meeting with them for an hour. They've agreed to the meeting. The first part of the meeting, they say, look, they want to cut it to 30 minutes because they want to see their daughter's soccer game. Out of a group of, we've known this for five years now. So... After thousands of people in front of this activity, I would say less than 5% of salespeople who've identified earlier in the program that they're really good at relationship building, only 5% ask about the daughter. 95% go with, okay, I'll keep it short. Okay, uh, you know, maybe they'll, they may make it as close as, boy, that's great, uh, I'll keep it fast. But they won't ask a question. The, the client gave them a rapport cue, told them something personal. And if you're good at relationship building, you hear that and you respond to it. So you can teach this to people, but you can't teach it to them unless they've had the experience where they recognize they don't do it as well as they think they do. Well, it's like, I guess it's like Phil Mickelson saying, yeah, I'm good at putting, so I don't need to putt anymore. I don't need need to practice putting anymore. Like, what? Well, yeah, and, 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 you know, but then he goes out there and you put him in a couple situations where he's not good. And he goes, oh, you know, downhill lies. I'm really not that good. Yeah. So I thought I was good. I told myself I was good, but until you put me in that situation, now I, now I agree. Um, so let, let me ask you something. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I mean, I'm, I mean, I've got, I've got five daughters. Yeah. Uh, 
and two boys. So sure. I'm always running to band practice, volleyball, uh, soccer, uh, my <laughs> junior in high school and soccer. So, uh, but I am, even though I like to have fun and drink good whiskey and talk smack about college football when it's business time, when I, if I truly only have 30 minutes, I don't want to talk about my daughter. Cause if I talk about my daughter with you that I don't know, cause it's a sales call, I'm not going to get my questions answered and I may be late to my daughter's game. And me personally, I don't believe that a, that a random salesperson gives a crap about my daughter and her soccer game. Well, first of all, you don't believe it because they don't ask. First of all, right? I mean, they don't ask. So you wouldn't even know because they don't ask. They think they ask, but they don't ask. So let's, let's, let's uh, believe me, they don't ask. I put them to exercise, they don't ask. Second of all, you're right in, in that there is a sense, it's art and science, right? So your communication style, you might be driving style or disc with D, high D. Right. Right. And you're a certain style that might say, yeah, I, you know, I don't like to talk about that stuff. Um, and hopefully I pick up that cue. So it's not the magic bullet always asking, but if, but you're the one who said daughter soccer game, right? You offered that up. Sure. I didn't come in saying, Hey, I've got, I didn't turn it about me. Let's, you know, I've got a daughter too, you know, and she's playing soccer this week. I didn't turn it. I didn't say that's the right answer. Right. I didn't say, Hey, before we get started, how are your kids? You know, it's like, well, I don't want to talk about my kids. Don't you know me? But you're the one who brought it up. So a mistake that people make, and there's another mistake, that a trap that you just set for me. But I can tell you a lot of high Ds and a lot of driving style people want to talk about their kids. Now, they'll talk about them in a different way. Right. My daughter plays soccer. Oh, you know, they're the number one team in the league. You know, or she's, she plays a travel and she's really great. And, you know, they were thinking about a scholarship. I mean, they'll talk about it in terms of metrics, in terms of performance, right. not in terms of uh, she really gets along well with the other players. And I'm really proud of her. And I mean, it'll, <laughs> it'll be a different sure. yeah, that's a great point. based on style. Right. But the fact that you bought it, I've had, I mean, I've had this happen where I spent a di- I spent dinner with uh, a client once in a new sales guy years ago. It was like 20 years ago. And I said, okay, what style is this person? And he goes, oh, she's clearly relationship oriented. I'm like, no, absolutely wrong. She's the opposite of that. He goes, well, how can that be? She talked about family. She talked about you know, her kids. She talked about you know, traveling. I'm like, okay, yeah, right. She did. What did she ask about our kids? He goes, nothing. What did she ask about our family? He goes, nothing. <laughs> I guess she's, she doesn't care about that stuff at all. And what did she say about her kids? And he goes, oh, the degrees they got and what they've achieved. I'm like, yeah. So she's not a relationship oriented buyer. That's not her style. Right. Her style is actually driving style. Mm-hmm. But sometimes people get confused and they, they fall into the trap you set for me. I don't want to talk about it. I never want to talk about it. But I bet there have been times you've talked about it, <laughs> Wes, with the oh, right I people, do. with the right relationship, you know? No, no, I, I, yeah. I do. But, like, I, I will throw that out there uh, when I, like, for sure got to get off the phone. Because then I don't have oh, to yeah. play any games. I don't have, I'm like, look, my wife is backing up the van. Okay, yeah, I got to go. That's a different thing. I, yeah, take a hint. So that, that's what, so I'll throw that out there. So I truly have a hard stop. Uh, and it's a great excuse for me. Can I, can I argue with you something? Sure. You just, my, and this is from experience. So you have to, I'm trying to beat you on experience. But I can tell you, based on my experience, that people that are driving style, like maybe yourself, they have the most problem with this concept because they look at it through their own lens and say, I don't want it. But you don't know if the customer wants it. And right. you don't even know if your fellow driving style wants it. But they're so, there's such a strong belief system that they don't want it, uh, that they don't want to talk about it. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't bring it up in the, con- you know, so I have to remind <laughs> them of the scenario. But the biggest pushback I get is from driving style salespeople who say, I would never want to do this. I'm like, well, it's not about you. It's about them. Yep. And they bought it up. So, yeah, that was fun. Let's do some more of that. <laughs> let's wrestle yeah. some other things to the ground what do you have yeah yeah because i mean I, I always tell my clients you know that you are not your client yeah right we have to adjust how we sell to match how our prospect buys yeah so it's, yeah it's buyer's perspective and it's i was reading yeah. an, hearing an interesting thing about it it's gonna blow your mind i think this is new brand new not my book it's in my book a little bit but not to this level but there's something called the mentalizer mentalizer's paradox that when, we, when we're kids, at age three or four years old, we start to realize, they do tests, and we start to realize that people think differently than us. That's the first time it happens. Before age three, four, what we know, we think they know. But we realize all of a sudden through a couple of tests that they don't know that. 
So we have this skill, right, to see that somebody has a different perspective, that they know things we don't know and all this. But that what they say in the research is that as people get more experience at higher levels in organization, they stop using that skill so much. And the reason is, is because they think it's a lower level skill, like waiters should do that, but I'm an executive and people should know what I'm thinking. And I shouldn't worry what my subordinates think. So it's interesting that the more sophisticated you become, sometimes the less you think you need to do that. But great salespeople do it, right? Great, great salespeople know that they have to constantly think about things from the buyer's perspective. Right. And get, and particularly negotiation, think about from their perspective. Yeah, I always tell the story when it was about 2002, I think, and I I took that Chester Harris negotiation class. <laughs> and from the airline books, look at you. You did it all. Look at you. Yeah, and, and I, you know, they advertise like crazy in like the Southwest sure. Airlines magazine, whatever. And But I, I was selling uh, telecom test and measurement equipment, and I was the only sales guy in the, in the train. It was, you know, 12, 15 people, something like that. Uh, I was the only salesperson. Everybody else was buyers. And it just, it opened my eyes to see oh, sure. things from their perspective. Neat. You know, and, and I it literally paid for itself. The course was like two grand. I got my company to pay. And literally the next week. You were better. I had, I had a $50,000 opportunity with Southwestern Bell when they were still SWB, whatever. And the guy needed our gear. And, and we, because they were a good client, we would give them five to 10% off just because. Yeah. Just because. Why not? But I knew he needed the gear. We were the sole source and he asked for a discount. He wasn't pushy. And I just said, yeah, we, that, we can't give it right now. This equipment's kind of back order, blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay. Yeah. It's crazy. So I mean, a 10% discount, even a 5% discount would be $2,500, which would have been a 20%, uh, 25% ROI on that course. The next week. And I was like, hey, boss, it paid for itself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> but people don't think that way. What is? Do we have bad sales managers? How come salespeople <laughs> don't know this stuff? How come they don't know? Well, they don't know it. Again, I think it's it's because they're not trained properly. I get you. Know, that's what I really do believe that. I think that the, the training that, you know, what is your, it's, it's the underlying belief system. I'm, I just designed a negotiation program for a global company. We're roll, it's, we roll it out next month, end of this month, next month. And yeah, it all starts with that. What do you have to believe? You know, think about, it starts with, we just start with a question. Think about the last couple of negotiations you've been involved with. Think about uh, what the impact would be to your business if you had a 2% increase across the portfolio. And then what would, what would have to be different? What behaviors would have to change? And they're not that great. I guess if we just listened a little bit more, asked some questions, didn't give away so much information, traded better. I mean, it's, it's a lot of that stuff, but nobody gets at the belief system because we do an activity where people negotiate and bef- with each other in the workshop. And before we show the results, we say, raise your hand if you thought you did well. Guess what happens? Everybody, Everybody thought they thinks did well. they did well. Yeah. We do, I mean, it's just on and on with salespeople. You can ask a group of 100 salespeople, raise your hand if you've won business because the customer likes you. Oh, 100. I guarantee you 100 hands will go up. And then you have to put their hands down. Then if you ask the same 100, raise your hand if you lost business because the customer didn't like you, raise your hand. You'd be amazed. You give it one or two hands. Like how unaware are we? I mean, and we are aware because we're optimistic, because sales is hard, because you got to get up every day, because selling is difficult. But, you know, welcome to third grade. Not everybody likes you. <laughs> you know, you, the deal you cut's not as good as the other guy's deal. You can learn from that, but you can't learn from it unless you see it and you realize, okay, there's something I can learn here. But because of the way we're taught, because of the way we're coached, because of the sales culture can get into all kinds of stuff that's unproductive. But you have to get after this sort of what's your underlying belief system. You know, your belief system around negotiations versus somebody else's belief system drives their behavior. It does, right? So that's what you, the negotiations you got. What do you believe? People say, oh, I believe in our value. We have value. We have value. But then what's the behavior associated with that? Is it you know, presenting an offer and saying, how does that sound? Is that okay with you? Uh, anything you need us to change? I mean, it's weak. Mm-hmm. That's some weak stuff. Those, that, that behavior isn't consistent with we have lots of value. Right. That behavior is consistent with fear-based. I'm going to lose this sale unless I, you know. So, there's a, so you got to get at that stuff. Right. You got to show people 
And then you got to say, what's this belief system? What's this belief system? What is get? Where are you on this continuum? And where do you have to get to? And, when, and you know, give them the skills to get there. But it's fun stuff. So you say like fear base. What what are salespeople afraid of? Are, are they afraid of being told no? Yeah, sure. They're afraid of being told no. They're being afraid of. It depends on their motivations. Right? We're all emotional beings who think. So you know, there's five dry. Wait a minute. People think. <laughs> yeah, they do. But everything comes through emotions first. I want to know where you hang out. I'm going to go hang out there because I, I don't see those people. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's five human emotions, right? One is meaning purpose. So if I don't make this sale, you know, that's less of it. It's usually about uh, relationships. If you're not being liked, uh, they're afraid of the consequence of the answer. If the answer is no, my God, how am I going to make my number? I mean, I've, I've coached salespeople. And I'll say, ask this, I manage salespeople. They'll ask this question. I'm afraid to ask this question. What are you afraid of? And they'll say the answer. Because the answer then will tell them something that they're afraid to know, which is this opportunity is not going to happen. That your pipeline is not as full as you thought. That you're going to go have to find new business. That you're not going to get the commission check that you're still kind of dreaming of. I mean, there's lots of things. But I would think the biggest one that I see is, yeah, the light. I mean, most salespeople... You know, and I get it, but you know, I would say I'm giving out numbers here, but I would suspect 80 percent the way they behave is they want to be liked versus being respected. I just tell I in a training recently, you like this, Wes. I had a person raise their hand. They said, "You're not going to like this." I said, "What am I going to like?" They said, "Well, every call I, I bring donuts to, every call I make, I bring donuts." And I said, "Okay." I said, "All I said was, so what do you think they call you when you leave?" And he get, and she it was a she. She goes the donut person. I'm like, yeah. So if you want to be the donut person, do what you want. Keep doing what you're doing. You know. So we. That's what's happening, right? They make that mistake. They they confuse. Now I'm not saying never bring donuts. I'm just saying if you're always bringing donuts, and that's your value proposition, then you get treated accordingly. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't bring donuts. Bring insight. You know, bring value. Right. But people get caught up in the wrong kind of things. Yeah. And they know, right? Some level, the manager hasn't, and there's, you know, managers need training and, and managers are a mixed bag. Um, managers, you brought them up, but, you know, just r- routinely, the question we ask when we do discovery, we do a lot of discovery work. So we ask, you know, we, we don't do anything off the shelf. So when we get hired, we go into the organization, we try to figure out what's going on. One thing that's going on almost uh, without exception is managers don't coach. We ask salespeople, I'm your man, if, if your manager says, I want to give you some coaching, what's about to happen? And it'll be good. It's not going to be good. You know, it's always criticism. I did something wrong. We ask managers how much they coach. They say, oh, I coach all the time. We ask the reps, how much coaching do you get? They go, none. Because managers think telling people what to do is coaching. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of work needs to be done with managers to get their head wrapped around what coaching really is. What about the semantics of lead, don't manage? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's all like, you know, it's, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I mean, I get it, but sometimes we focus on the wrong syllable, right? We get all excited about, well, is it leadership training or management training? I don't know. Just we're going to get them better. Is that good enough or no? We got to, you know, learning objectives. The, right. the training industry has been part of the death of the training industry has been done by instructional designers who focus almost exclusively on getting the learning objective to be written well. And <laughs> you're like, don't you want to know what's actually happening in the class? They think the learning objective is the answer. Right. Not the answer, right? It's the behavior change is, is what we're going for. And to get behavior change, you have to have a really clever d- design to keep people engaged, to get them asking the right questions, to put them through experiences that matter, to tap into their wisdom. But yeah, so no, lead versus manage, I don't know. I mean, you have to do both. As a sales manager, you got to manage, which is look at the numbers, have the pipeline discussions. Leading, right. you can argue, is more about inspiration and, and modeling the right behavior, yeah. uh, providing a model. So yeah, you can segment the two groups. But at the end of the day, you got to do your job, which is probably both leading and managing. So if they call you in and say, hey, you know, we have, you know, Miller Hyman, pink and blue sheets. The, we got the Salesforce module plug in, blah, blah, blah. You know, we just need you to help us work within that. You know, will, will you work within that model or do you? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. When we, we, well, yes, we do. And we're one of the only ones who does. Uh, now, you know, I, I can. I mean, I'm certified in some of the stuff you're talking about. Right. In my journey in the chemical industry and in the training industry, I've gotten certified, so I know that stuff intimately. I probably know the four of the five biggest methodologies pretty deeply. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And so, and I believe it's all about the learners. Hey, we're, we're completely learner focused. Who is the learner? Where do they need to go? The learner should be the star of the story. They should get the best lines, not the facilitator. They should do most of the talking. This whole play that we're putting on to be dramatic is about the learner, not about the training company or the facilitator. But for 30, 40 years since I've been involved, it's no, it's about the training company and the facilitator. It's about the learner right? when it comes to the classroom. So, of course, we want to integrate. And if, they, if the learner likes the word buying influence, uh, buying persona, or we like to call it the economic buyer, but these people, you know, you, you can use that language. I'm not going to make it change your language to right. fit what we're trying to do in the, in the, next, the next piece of content. So if you've got the rights to the language, and we're very flexible when it comes to our intellectual property. And we're very flexible when it comes to training the trainers. I mean, because we all want the same, we all should want the same thing. I think we do. I think when it comes to my company and my customers, what they want is the sales team to perform better. Which, so I share their, so if they think that the current language has some stickiness, well, yeah, let's not unstick that. Let's keep building on that. Right. Yeah, so I'm very passionate about the learner. Because I get out for 20 years, I was a learner. Right. When I worked for Dow Chemical, I worked for FMC, these other companies. You know, I was a learner and I saw what was done. Well, I'm a husband and a father, so I don't know anything, okay? All day long, I'm told, but anyway. All day long. How old are your kids? Are they teenagers? Are they? 21, 20, 18, 16, 14, 11, and 4. Well, you're dumb as a rock, and you're going to be dumb as a rock for a long time. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see any good days ahead for you. Well, the older ones will start thinking you're bright, but you've got a long way to go to get the They're whole They're slowly thing. getting there, slowly getting there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you talked about before, like, hey, how many of you have won business because your customer liked you? How many lost business because they didn't like you? Uh, and we all know that the people buy people they know, like, and trust. Yeah. Um, is there too much emphasis on liking and yeah. maybe not enough on trusting? Yeah, way too much on liking. I don't care if people like me. I mean, I'd like them to like me. It'd be nice if they liked me, but they don't have to buy from me to like me. Right. They have to buy from me, ultimately, if it's, it's to respect me. And I, and I can make $10,000 sales all day on like, but if I want to make 100000 or a million or whatever that number is in your business, you got to be respected. That, that's respect money. Like money is cheap. <laughs> Like it is, it's cheap, it's free, it's, you know, it's out there. I can get like money all day long. Right. You know, but respect money is more money. So to be respected, I'm going to, and, you know, Challenger has this in their beginning of their book. You have to challenge their thinking. I got to put an idea out. I got to provoke. Mm -hmm. I got to take some risk. Right. I got to say, hey, if I were you, I'd be doing this. What am I missing? I have to have a point of view. To have a point of view that I can take a risk with, I've had to really learn about my industry and learn about the business and, you know, be paying attention. I think I worked for me once. He's like, uh, you know, how do you do what you do? I'm like, I read. And because he said, I want to do what you do. I said, we well, got to read. He never read. Mm -hmm. So he had, he had desire, but no discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to sell big deals. Okay. Go read. Okay. I just want to walk around saying I'd like to sell big deals <laughs> rather than the discipline. So there is a discipline and a rigor that comes along with providing insight, but you've got to always have that insight with humility. So it's really art and science because I can have insight, but if I'm going to walk in on Ernst and Young, or Pritzker Group, these are they're naming my clients. These are big companies with smart people. If I go in there and act like I'm the smartest guy in the room, dead man walking. But if I go in there and say, hey, I've been thinking about you, and here's what I think I'd be doing. You know, what am I missing? Have you guys thought about this? Now we have a conversation. Most people want a thinking partner. They don't want the answer. Because if the answer was easy, they would have thought of it. Right. It's kind of insulting for you to come in off the street and have the answer. That's kind of just insulting by, you know, Table stakes, that's insulting. I'd be insulted. Like, where are you? Get out of here. Even if you're right, get out of here. Um, but to go in and say, hey, I think I have an idea for you. Let's, let's banner it about. I think that's, that's the winning play. So it's, it's insight with humility. That's where I separate with Challenger. Challenger goes off and uses words like teach your client. You, know, you need to teach your client. Rationally drown them. Give them all this data and drown them. So a lot of sales methodologies get into this cognitive overload and you're going to win because you know you are smarter than the client i think that's just hubris and and, and high risk and not worth the risk you know I, I love what you said there but most people want a thinking partner not the answer um i mean i was literally I'm, i've been thinking about this over the weekend just how i'm changing my approach and, and going after bigger clients and more on the consulting side and and it literally i mean hit me it's like why would they want me 
right? And, and part of it was like bragging rights. Like, hey, I'm spending a lot of money. Right, right. On an advisor. On a, I, ha- I have enough money that I can spend a lot of money. How cool on, is this? This is on, great. On, on, yeah, on, on a thinking partner. Because right? I, I don't show up. I, I've read a lot. I've done a lot. But I know I still got a lot to learn. Yeah. I know I've always said the new ABCs of selling are not always be closing, but it's always be curious. Ah, uh, beautiful. Yeah. Right. right. Always yeah. be concise. Always be courteous. Yeah. And, and so part of it, because a, a friend of mine, he drives nice cars, you know, and he says, look, I could drive a Honda. You know, I want to drive a nice car. And he's like, it, it's a state inducer. I get in a different state of mind and of being, and it, it changes my my DNA, right? Just about and right. I perform better. I'm like, okay, that's fair enough. And it's like maybe I'm just a state inducer. They're like, I'm paying a lot of money for this guy. Let me set everything aside and focus. Let me think clearly. Okay, I had a good idea, and you were around. You're worth the money, right? And it's like I think it could be almost that simple, right? Or right. at least a big component of it. Right. No, I think you're right. No, I, I like that. I'm, I'm a steel state inducer, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I did. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. But it's but it's true in anything. I, I've seen studies like where they they put two glasses of wine, right? They hook people's brains up with those electrodes. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and they're like, "What do you think of this? This is a you know a four dollar um, grocery store wine." And I guess like, yeah, pretty good. Well, this one is you know from Napoleon's secret cellar, you know, and. And then the, the receptors light up and they're like, hey, it's the same bottle of wine and it's yeah, both four bucks. But because they believed it was better, they felt better about it. Sure. You know, it's called, it's called priming. You can prime people and then you can there you go. Go prime. Yeah. So so on your site, you talk about the, the four pillars. Context is king, wisdom in and out of the room. Uh, engagement is the word. How how can a quota carrying salesperson differentiate themselves uh, and and engage this C-level executive that they may be a little bit afraid of, right? How, how can they get that person's attention to become trusted, to become respected, you know, to engage when they just feel like they're just a dude with a quota? <laughs> well, yeah, those principles you're citing are around our training, so how we train people, right? Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. No, that, that's okay, but they apply to, because we do leadership training, all kinds of training. So we design training. I mentioned we do discovery. Context is king. Wisdom in the room is we get, tap in the wisdom of, of the participants. Engagement oh, sure. designs are very clever, and then integration. But, you know, they do apply to, uh, to any kind of quota carrying salesman. I mean, context is king, meaning right. it's always about the buyer. It's right. always going on for them. It's what it's what the value they perceive, not the value your company perceives, or it's what they want to talk about, not what you want to talk about. Right. Now it's controlling that conversation and asserting some control and having some some our art around that. But it is their context. They have wisdom, so find out what they have. But engagement, um, how do you engage at that level? Zig Ziglar said it long before I did, and you just referred to it. Questions are always the answer. Always be curious. Worry less about what you're going to say and worry a lot more about what you're going to ask. You know, people like to talk and they like to talk about themselves. And if you're talking, they want you to talk about them. You talking about you is the least interesting thing. Yeah. So how can I say as little about me as possible or only talk about me in relation to you, to what's important to you? So if I met a C-level person tomorrow, you know, if I had a sense, if I did my homework, of course, I would do my homework. I would investigate it. But it would ultimately be, hey, you know, he said, well, tell me about JM Group. I think, well, you know, based on looking at your bio and, and LinkedIn and your company, you know, here are the three things I think you'd find of interest mm-hmm. and, and make him brief and shut up and make him curious. Yeah. But then I want to flip it back on him. I had a senior guy once on the phone. He said, I've only got 15 minutes. Tell me about your company. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I only need two minutes to tell you about my company. Can I ask you questions for 13 minutes? <laughs> he said, Oh yeah, that'd be great. I mean, cause most salespeople, you know, tell me about your company, crank the back and we start yapping. Yeah. And I'm like, don't talk. When you talk, you create objections. Mm-hmm. My name's John Reed. Oh, I had a guy in college named John Reed. I hated him. I mean, no matter what you say, there's a potential to have an objection. So part of sales is objection avoidance. So talking about yourself, your companies, your other customers, your clients, you know, what you, wait. I mean, that's, that's like later. 
you know, let them talk. Mm -hmm. But get good at asking good questions. Get good mm -hmm. at being curious. Be comfortable with being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I had a client, I have a client, a big client of mine. They talked about MBOs, which is new business opportunities. But I'm not familiar with that term. I wasn't. Now, people are going to be listening to they'll be laughing or they'll be like, they weren't familiar either. But I just was not. And I was thinking, MBOs, management by objectives? Because mm -hmm. I know MBOs. But I think, I said, I think they're thinking NBOs. So what, what did he call it? NBOs. N as in Nancy, B as in boy, O as in. Right. And, and what were they? Because I'm taking notes as we're talking. And that, so stands, and that stands for new business opportunities. Oh, yeah. Everybody's got their new their acronyms. Right. So, but most salespeople would not ask. Right. Here I am, 59. I run my own company. We're global. and I, But I'm okay saying, I'm sorry, are you saying NBO or MBO? And they're like, NBO. And I'm like, what is that? Right. And they told me. But a lot of salespeople would be like, I know, because I teach them and I, I let them. Yeah. And they wouldn't ask that. No. I think I was supposed I to know. I think I was supposed to know that. You know, I thought I was supposed to know it, so I couldn't ask it. No, ask it. No, you no. can practice it. You can preface it by saying, you know, I think I know what that means, but I want to be right. When you say NBO, what do you mean? At least you can preface it and save yourself a little if you, have, you need to do that. But with executives, it's all about asking questions. It's about asking good questions, great questions. Um, it's about, you know, there's an acronym we use, be brief, be good, and be gone. You know, the killer bee. <laughs> right? I mean, you want to get the hell out of there. You want to, but, you, but you want to establish. And once you, once you get high, stay high. I, you know, I learned this when selling myself, Wes. You know, once I had that relationship, I had that relationship. A lot of people get there and then don't tend to it, go back down and never get back up again. Mm -hmm. It's like, you had it. What happened? Well, and then, and then they start to ask permission from their buyer if they can. It's like, what do you, don't ask for permission. You know, mm -hmm. don't take no from somebody who can't say yes. You mm -hmm. know, you know. So I don't ask for permission. I tell buyers, hey, I'm going to be meeting with your boss next week. Anything you want me to bring up, avoid, you know. But I'm not, is it okay if I meet with your boss? Right. But that's a belief system. My belief system is I deserve to, you know, I, that I'm credible and I'm competent and I should have meetings with everybody in the organization to drive value. And I got to stay, I mean, there's a whole belief system that says it's the right thing to do. And I'm not subservient to my buyer. Right. You know, interesting stuff. Yeah, that's um, one of the seven deadly sins of selling I wrote was equating selling with begging. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know? I am not your whipping boy, right? I'm not bringing in donuts in a PowerPoint presentation so you can tie me to the whipping post. No, no. Yeah. Take it out yeah. on me. It's like, no, find somebody else. And I'm not a dancing chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. Uh, man, all right, this was awesome. Uh, okay, fi final question. Are you, are you ready? Yes. Are you uh, ready? All right, okay, go ahead. Okay, and you can't phone a friend. You can't, no, there's no, there's no buzzer. So... You know, our, our listeners are, they're driving, they're on a treadmill, right? They're, right. they're okay. mountain biking, whatever. They, they, wow. They're, they're You're listening. from California. You got a mountain biking and Zoom and all that good stuff. Keep going. Oh, man. Well, you mentioned get high, stay high. I have to put a disclaimer there. We're not talking about smoking dope, okay? But anyway, um, when, as a result of listening to this episode, um, I mean, we're going to link to your website, your books, all that, but what? What should they do to change their outcome? This is, this is going to come out almost immediately. So they're going to have all of 2019 right. to apply one key lesson. What should they do as a result of listening to this to move the needle? I would say two things. They're one, but it's one A and one B. I mean, you just, most salespeople are quasi-curious. They're curious in the realm of what they're trying to sell. They ask questions limited to that. They say, how's your day going or how you been? But I mean, the curious about the business is limited to what they're trying to sell. And I think you want to break that. And I just think you want to be more curious. Uh, I believe it's in the book. I was a strong believer in my whole career that you, out, you want to out understand your competitors. You don't want to out persuade them. Persuasion, out persuading is hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. Uh, it's tough to make a, you know, differences when the out persuasion part, but you can out understand them. And when people truly feel understood, they trust your solution anyway. I, I have such little problems. And this is, I mean, it sounds bragging, but there's some truth. There's a lot of truth to what I'm going to say. Little problems closing business and getting, when I get to that phase, because they feel so well understood. And they're like, okay, this must work because you understand us so well. But most salespeople don't understand their clients that well. Most the data says only 11% of 
salespeople think clients really understand their need. Customers, salespeople really. So only 11% of customers believe salespeople really understand their needs. I mean, how awful is that? 11%. Right. So I think in your own portfolio, if you said, geez, only 11% of my customers think I understand them, there's a lot of work to do. But the more you understand, the more they feel heard, the more they'll trust your solution. And oh, by the way, the bigger your sale will be because you have a more understanding of the complexity of the issue. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, the, sale, the size of the sale goes up. So that's what I would encourage anybody to do. Just be more curious, get better at asking questions. We're just so incurious. Right. We think, again, just like I said about trust, it's another one of these topics, accountability, that sales people think they're good at, and they're just not. They're just right. not. There's very few that are really good at asking great questions. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you, sir. Mr. Thank John you. Reed, all the way from Jersey. Uh, we're going to be linking to uh, your new book, Moving from Models to Mindsets, Rethinking the Sales Conversation. And uh, link to your site as well, right? JM, where is it? I got too many things up here. JMReadGroup.com, right? Yep, and it's R E I D. R E I D. Got it. All right. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, sir. It's great catching up with you. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Don't bring donuts, bring insight. That's a writer downer. But hey, I told you, he got a few from me. You're in the right place if you want to learn how to make every sale. Um, I love the discussion we had about models, skill versus will, your belief systems drive sales behaviors. I love it. Sales enablement today is not about the model. Most sales professionals believe they're good at relationship building, and we know they're not. You probably aren't as good as you thought you are. If you're honest with yourself in the quiet recesses of your brain, of your cubicle and your car, we're afraid. People always use weak words. If I listen to someone on the phone or we're role-playing, 100% of the time they'll throw out weak words. and They don't even know it. Those words are killing you. If your average sale, if you look at this and say, all right, let's say you make $500 per sale and you're using weak words. And I I guarantee you the weak words you're using are causing you to lose 30 to 90% of your sales. It's 100% of the objections you get on price are because of the weak words and the phrases that you use. So maybe you're a great salesperson, but you're leaving money on the table because you're using weak words you don't even realize. What if you sold the exact same number of people this next year, but you sold them at a 10 or 20% increase, 30% increase? You know it's possible. You know there's others in your industry, maybe your company, doing that same thing. You know there are people that don't work as hard, they don't provide the same quality of product and service that you do, but they sell at a higher price. And it's because they have eliminated weak words. Guarantee it. What if you eliminated 70 or 80 or 90% of your weak words? I guess we all maybe slip down into it sometimes. I don't know. I guess I do. I don't think so. Not much, right? Because I've, I've had this pounded in my head for 15 years. But uh, nobody's perfect. So I admit, I probably slip from time to time. But not often. When the money's on the line, I know how to conduct myself, how to steer the conversation. So the pressure is on the prospect. And they want to relieve the pressure by doing business with me. Just like a drowning person will grab any hand are you doing that with your prospects? You know, we talked about the, the insight plus humility takes rigor. Desire with no discipline is worthless. What is your desire? Do you desire? Do you want to be a great salesperson? Do you want to make more money? But you're spending hours a day debating on Facebook. You're spending hours a day scrolling through LinkedIn. You're spending hours a day watching movies on Netflix. You're spending hours a day at the bar 
instead of at the gym, instead of at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, instead of hanging out in the Make Every Sale community, asking questions, asking people, including me, to look at your landing pages, review your email sequences, help you with your voicemail, right? It, it's, it's there, right? How, you, how do you choose to spend your time? Wanting to hit your goals is not enough. Do you have the discipline to do what you need to do to hit your goals? And that includes investing in yourself. I'm going to keep pounding it in your head, so just do it. All right, go invest in yourself, would you? MakeEverySale.com. When you invest in yourself, you also get a signed copy of my new book, The Sales Whisper Away. And you will want that book, I promise you. Great stories, easy to read, but um, impactful. Uh, it'll move the needle. All right? So come join us, MakeEverySale.com. As always, thank you for listening. Please subscribe. Please share this. When you share it, when you subscribe, it increases the download numbers. The more downloads I get, the better guests I get, the more sponsorships I get, the more I can give of myself in this free medium to help more people. All right? I need you to share it. Give me five-star reviews on Google, everywhere, right? On the blog, Facebook page, iTunes. It all adds up. It all helps. You'll be surprised how few people do it. You'll also be surprised at how more um, likely you are to ask for referrals and testimonials when you give them yourself. So go do that for me, would you please? Thank you very much. Now go sell something. <laughs>